Welcome forensic science students. This is our first video notes presentation. It's going to be on the history and de development of forensic science. Now what does exactly the word forensics mean and how does that relate to science? Well the word forensics comes from the Latin word forensis meaning forum and during the time of the Romans when there was a criminal charge being uh, brought up against someone it would have to be presented in front of a something similar to a jury, a group of people. Um, both the person accused of the crime and the accuser would give speeches based on their side of the story. The individual with the best argument, according to the crowd that was listening, would uh, typically determine the outcome of the case. That same word, forensis, is now applied to our forensic science, um, meaning that it's applied to a court of law. So forensic science is any science being applied to a court of law. Forensic anthropology would be anthropology applied to a court of law. Forensic geology would be geology applied to a court of law. Now the history of forensics is pretty diverse. One of the first instances we see of forensics, um, specifically the first autopsy was actually performed on Julius Caesar by a physician called Antistius. Now, Caesar was stabbed on the Ides of March uh, 23 times. His body was brought back by his servants to his house. Antistius was called in. He takes a look at the body and determines that there are 23 stab wounds. He's even able to determine that the fatal stab wound was actually the second stab wound, one that pierced um, through the back, up underneath the left shoulder blade, and pierced the heart. In around 700 AD, we see the use of fingerprints. The Chinese specifically used them for identifying documents and clay sculptures. They would uh, put a fingerprint on a piece of clay, fire it, that print would be preserved in the clay, and that would be used to determine ownership. Around 1149, King Richard of England actually creates the job of a coroner to investigate questionable deaths. Now, one thing we'll talk about later is the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner. A coroner, historically, is always someone that is appointed, um, an individual that is appointed to their station. More recently, it can be appointed by a county or other individuals. Um, a medical examiner is one that actually has their doctorate. Now, around 1248, a very interesting Chinese book is published called The Washing Away of Wrongs. This book is a bunch of series of case studies that detail how people can differentiate between uh, suicides, accidental deaths, natural causes, and homicides. The book distinguishes between how you can indicate drowning, looking for water in the lungs, versus strangulation, looking for pressure marks or bruising around the neck. Um, it also details the first case of forensic entomology, which is the study of bugs. A sigh, which is a, um, excuse me, not a sigh, a sickle, which is a curved blade um, used for agricultural purposes, um, was the murder weapon in a particular case. This investigator has all the villagers lay out their sickles. Flies are attracted to only one of the sickles. The investigator then confronts the man who that sickle belongs to, and he actually confesses to the crime. Now, where do we see our modern forensic science? The, uh, the first appearance of experts in the courtroom start to show up around 18th century BC. Occasionally, experts are called in to testify through specific cases, but none of these experts have expertise in one specific area. They typically are generalists. They kind of focus on a lot of different science um, and they may be called in to just talk about one specific case. Now later with the emergence of modern chemistry, you start to see more scientific testing and the reliance on statistics to prove that that evidence is actually connected to a person or a crime. Now, some of the important developments that occur in forensic science, pretty much due to scientists. Um, around 1670, Anton von, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that last name, of Holland, constructs the first high-powered microscope. This is extremely important because it's very useful in the analysis and collection of trace evidence. 
1776, uh, Paul Revere, and yes, that's the one if by land, two if by sea Paul Revere, he identifies the body of General Joseph Warren based on the false teeth that Paul Revere had made for him. Paul Revere is actually kind of a Renaissance man. He did a little bit of everything, including forensic dentistry. In 1784, when a, a very important event happens, and this is the John Toms case. John Toms is an individual who is convicted of murder on the basis of a torn wad of paper that was found in his pocket. Now, this piece of paper matched a a torn piece of paper that was taken um, and from a gun found at the scene of a crime. Now this gun, they would use um, paper as wadding and stuff it down the barrel. They were able to take the wadding out of the barrel and match it to the piece of paper that John Toms had in his pocket. This is very important because this is one of the first use of what we call individual evidence to convict a person. In 1859, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen developed the science of spectroscopy. And yes, this is the Robert Bunsen who developed our Bunsen burners that we use in chemistry. And then in 1864, crime scene photography really becomes developed and popularized. And one thing that you have to know in this class is that photography is probably the most important thing that's related to investigating a crime scene. All right, our next set of developments. The first I'm gonna talk about a little later, but it came up in 1879. It's called the Bertillian system. Now this system is a method of identifying uh, people. So differentiating between you and me or you and your brother. How would you know um, and what would you write on paper to be able to separate the two of you? In 1887, the first Sherlock Holmes story is published by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. In 1893, Hans Gross publishes a book called Criminal Investigations. Now, this is the first forensic science textbook that is widespread. Hans Gross is actually the first person who developed the Journal of Criminalistics. Um, he is also one of the first people um, to be a generalist, so someone who specializes in many different areas of forensic science. In 1896, Sir Edward Henry develops the first classification system for fingerprint identification. Now, we still use fingerprints today as a method of identification. Now, Sir Edward Henry comes up with a way so that we can take what we know about fingerprints and actually store it into files that people can look up and they can look at that file information and be able to determine what kind of fingerprints they were looking for. Because if you remember back in 1896, they wouldn't have things like CODIS or a database that would bring up kind of a digital image of what your, uh, what your fingerprint should, be, should look like. His method is still used in some cases. Some of the forensic scientists today were originally trained on that method. However, it's pretty much fallen out of favor with the use of electronic databases now. In 1900, Carl Landsteiner identifies human blood groups. So if A, the AB, the O, and the B blood groups are what we're talking about. And this is a way to differentiate blood found at a scene of a crime or on a murder weapon from a victim or a suspect. The low card principle is from 1904, and we will definitely talk about that later. That's one of our most important things. In 1922, Francis Aston developed the mass spectrometer. This piece of equipment is extremely important in the use of toxicology, uh, determining blood alcohol content, um, differentiating between different kinds of trace evidence. It's probably one of the most used pieces of equipment in forensic testing. And then in 1950, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences is founded. This is a community that has subgroups that specialize in all the different areas. So they have a subgroup of anthropology, they have a subgroup of um, medical examiners, they have a subgroup in dentistry, um, and they basically take care of the certification. So if you're going to be a board certified forensic scientist, this is typically the organization where a group of peers decide what constitutes a certification in that group and what do you have to do to keep and maintain that certification. Now, don't forget to see part two of this presentation where we talk about people of historical significance in forensic science. That should be the very next link on the book webpage.